it has been done before. So it is not something that um, the AFCFTA has, it's not a reinvention of the wheel. Uh, we are using models that have been used before in other parts of um, the world, in other trade agreements. The most important point that I would like to emphasize is that Africa is now trading under new rules, new preferences, because we want to build a single integrated market on the African continent. And I know that in some parts of the world, we get criticism. Um, we are criticized, we are told that we are rushing things, that we're actually not quite ready. But I want to ask those who hold that view, tell me of a trade agreement where all countries are ready at the same time. I don't know it. I have never heard of a trade agreement where in that particular arrangement, every single country is ready on day one. Not to my knowledge, it doesn't exist. And so I, I, um, I regret that as Africans, we are held to a much, much higher standard for how trade agreements should operate in practice. We negotiated this agreement in record time. Yes, of course, we're still continuing with negotiations, but there are other arrangements that have taken much longer than us to negotiate and to enter into force. There are other agreements that have been going on negotiations for decades. And we have been able to do this in less than five years. We're not doing it because we want to prove anything to anybody outside of the African continent. We are doing this because it is in Africa's interest to have an integrated market. And so to the extent that uh, um, there is something that we have to demonstrate and there is something that we have to prove it is to 1.2 billion Africans that we shall and we are committed to an integrated market on the continent. And that the 1st of July, I'm sorry, the 1st of January, 2021 was actually the start of that process. Market integration is not an event. It is a process. It takes time. It took the European Union almost 60 years to get to the depth of integration that the European Union um, has achieved today. And so similarly, Africa's market integration objectives will take time, but you've got to start somewhere. And on the 1st of January, 2021, we as Africans started in earnest on that journey of market integration. Let me conclude by saying the following. We will introduce um, uh, mechanisms for supporting trade under the AFCFTA. One of the uh, mechanisms that we are working on uh, with Africsim Bank, and I'm very grateful for the support of, um, of Africsim Bank. One of the uh, mechanisms that we are working on is a payments, a pan-African payments and settlement platform, uh, which Africsim Bank uh, has agreed to provide the liquidity for the settlement and the payments an initial amount of about $500 million that Africsim Bank uh, is providing so that when a trader in Ghana trading under the FCFTA has to transact under the FCFTA with a counterparty in Kenya, that uh, Ghanaian exporter um, will be able to transfer uh, 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 funds in local currency, in other words, Ghanaian CD, to uh, the counterparty in Kenya, who will receive uh, the funds in Kenyan shillings. So we want to reduce the cost, the cost that is associated with converting local currency to the dollar in order to be able to transact under the AFCFTA. We all know uh, uh, the complications that arise from currency trading and the, ex and the cost associated um, with convertibility of uh, the need to convert uh, our currencies in order to be able to trade amongst one another. We have 42 currencies on the African continent and that in and of itself um, is a complicating factor when we want to uh, uh, ensure that we have a consolidated market on the African continent. But we believe along with Africs in Bank that the Pan-African Payments and Settlement Platform will take us a step 
uh, in the direction of resolving the challenges of multi-currency trading on the African continent, particularly in relation to the AFCFTA. Second, we are working with uh, commercial banks on the African continent to raise a minimum of $1 billion uh, for a trade finance facility, primarily, primarily for small medium enterprises so that the, the, the benefits of this agreement, the market access that this agreement creates um, is not taken advantage of only by the big corporations on the African continent, but such that our small medium enterprises, women in trade, young Africans in trade can also have the opportunity to grow their businesses, to grow their uh, um, export trading uh, companies uh, by having the support of this $1 billion uh, trade finance uh, facility in support of trading under the AFCFTA. And in due course, we will make a concrete announcement of the modalities for this uh, trade finance uh, facility. So we are very determined to make sure that the AFCFTA and trading under the AFCFTA, as I said earlier, is indeed commercially meaningful. We're also introducing digitally enabled platforms to make sure that um, there is interconnectivity on the African continent, interconnectivity for business expansion, for reaching new customers, and on the AFCFTA app, a trader will be able to access a new market in a different part of the African continent. So you will be able to access the market in West Africa from Malawi in Southern Africa and vice versa. And through digital enabled platforms, we believe that we can accelerate, we can accelerate interconnectivity, particularly of small medium enterprises across the African continent so that we reach our goals of uh, reducing barriers or uh, trade and investment barriers uh, uh, in, in Africa in accordance with the objectives of this agreement. Let me conclude by saying the following. A few months ago, um, the World Bank released a report uh, that amongst other findings uh, found that where we implement the AFCFTA effectively as the African continent, we have a potential opportunity um, to, to push back the frontiers of poverty and to lift 100 million Africans out of poverty, 70 million Africans out of moderate poverty and 30 million Africans out of uh, extreme poverty. And more importantly, that presents us with an opportunity to, to close the gender salary gap and to make sure that at the center of uh, benefits that come from this agreement, um, women and young Africans are the immediate beneficiaries from implementation of this agreement. So by 2035, we can double intra-Africa trade. By 2035, we can lift 100 million Africans out of poverty. And all of that, all of that will have started on the 1st of January, 2021. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be a daunting task. It's going to be very difficult, but we know, we know from market integration initiatives of other parts of the world that it's not easy and that it's a very difficult task. Some countries, as I said earlier, some countries will actually be legally committed, politically committed, but in terms of the administrative infrastructure, the customs infrastructure that is required, they may need a little bit more time um, to start in earnest the, the trading. And so I wanted to take this opportunity to have a conversation with you, my fellow Africans, um, to assure you that we indeed have started trading under new rules on the 1st of January, 2021. It may take some time before uh, each of us see the direct benefits. But again, I emphasize that market integration does not happen overnight. It is a process 
that takes time. But at least we have had a very good start and I'm very encouraged uh, by all the messages of support from um, millions and millions of Africans across the length and breadth of our continent. Africans know that this is a task that we have to uh, confront head on, that this is a challenge that we have to confront head on. We're not going to get another opportunity as the African continent to integrate our market. This is our last opportunity. And all the heads of states are fully in support. All the governments um, of Africa are fully in support. Um, this is a challenge that we shall face collectively as an African continent. And so we are not going to be deterred by our critics. Certainly, I am not going to be discouraged by those who criticize us from other parts of the world, who say that we say, we proclaim we've started trading, but they, they don't see evidence of that. Our commitment and our responsibility is to 1.2 billion Africans. Those are the people to whom we have to demonstrate seriousness. 1.2 billion Africans. Those are the people who have to see that in earnest, we are trading under this agreement. I am accountable to them, 1.2 billion Africans. I'm accountable to all the governments of the African continent. I'm not going to be discouraged by those who seek always to criticize the initiatives that this continent undertakes. As long as I'm the Secretary General, I commit to you, 1.2 billion Africans, that we as a Secretariat shall do everything that we can to make sure that the positive projections of this agreement, the fact that we have an opportunity in 15 years time to lift 100 million Africans out of poverty, I commit to you that that is our primary objective for the next 15 years. I thank you very much, uh, Madam Tanka, and I will take questions at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Excellency. And for those who are just joining us now, uh, we have just listened there to the Secretary General of the African Continental uh, Free Trade Area, His Excellency Wamkele uh, Mene. He was briefing us on the status of the AFCFTA. Now we will start by taking the questions, but uh, please, I want to remind you when you are sending your questions, make sure that you identify your press organs and uh, your name. Um, the first question that I have here on the Q&A box is from Raphael Oyi, who is uh, working for the Auditor Diplomat Extra Magazine, Abuja, Nigeria. His question is, what is expected of the media, when, of the media men across the continent to help smooth flow of the AFCFTA, basically as members of the fourth exit, what uh, modalities should be adopted? That's the question number one. Maybe we'll go to another question. Before was, we... that, was that what is expected of the media? Of the media. Okay. Thank you. Maybe you should first answer that question. Well, we I, I, I can take uh, uh, three questions and I answer okay. them in a, um, in a batch. Okay. All right. Uh -huh. um, the second question is from Jean-Pierre Alumba Lukamba. As you said, it well on the 1st January, 2021, Africans started by uh, uh, started to trade. How they can trade effectively while AU AFCFTA didn't yet launch the free movement on the facilitation of movement under the new AFCFTA rules of African and the diaspora. The movement of people in our continent. That's the number two questions of the, from the same person. The, mo the movement of people in uh, our continent is still very challenging, especially in some African economic regions such as the SADC and the north of Africa. How far with the implementation of the Pan-African passport to the ordinary Africans and the diaspora? Okay. 
Okay, we, 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 we can take one more, uh, Madam Tanko. Okay, a very short one from Jean-Pierre Alumba Lukamba. How about the road infrastructures and flight routine? Right. Thank you very much uh, for those questions. Um, the, the media is a very important uh, stakeholder uh, in our work because um, we are able to communicate uh, through the media uh, to communicate with Africans um, the work that we are doing. And we are able to disseminate uh, information about the work that we are doing uh, through the media. And thus far, we have been working with the African Union, of course, who have uh, arranged uh, this session uh, as an organ of the African Union. We have been working together uh, from time to time to ensure that we have these press uh, briefings so that we can disseminate information uh, to uh, the whole of the African continent. Uh, the Secretariat is available uh, at all times uh, at your disposal as uh, the media uh, for information briefings, um, uh, to obtain uh, information from us, um, in my capacity, I provide interviews uh, to uh, uh, media outlets across the African continent to give an update of the work uh, that we are doing. And so um, we, we, are a, we are at the disposal of um, our partners in, in the media uh, for the purpose of uh, disseminating information. Now, in respect of um, movement of persons, the, the protocol on the movement of persons is not part of the AFCFTA. It is a standalone uh, protocol. It is a standalone uh, instrument which has not yet entered into force. So it is not yet legally binding um, as, as an instrument. I do, of course, uh, take the point, the underlying point that uh, uh, Jean-Pierre um, is asking, and, um, or, and, and all I would say is that we can only do what the agreement enables us to do, what the AFCFTA, which is law, binding law, what it enables us to do. We are not able to move beyond what the agreement uh, has provided. The agreement does not make provision for free movement of persons. The agreement, however, does make provision uh, for the movement of business persons and that negotiation of identifying the categories um, of the movement of business persons um, is the subject of negotiations in the context of uh, trade in services. So um, we are enabling movement of business persons uh, in the context of what the agreement provides for, of what the agreement allows. Um, we don't have the legal authority to move beyond that. Um, the ability or, or, or the, 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 if we wanted to have free movement of persons, that is entirely up to the member states of the African Union. It is not the African Union as an institution. It is the member states uh, themselves who can decide at what point um, they want to, to ratify the protocol on the movement of persons. I think it's very important to, 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 to be very clear about this. It is not the AFCFTA Secretariat. It is not the African Union Commission. It is the member states of the African Union themselves who can actually decide the point at which we have full um, free movement of persons across the African continent. But as I've said, to the extent that the AFCFTA, the agreement establishing the AFCFTA, to the extent that it, it allows uh, movement of business persons, we are facilitating that in accordance um, with uh, uh, the law itself. Similarly, on the issue of the Pan-African passport, it is not part of our work. Um, we have a very narrow mandate, and that is trade. Um, our mandate comes from 
the agreement establishing the AFCFTA. Unfortunately, on some of these things, we are not in a position um, to do things beyond what the, what the law enables us uh, to do. We have to subject ourselves to the rule of law. And in this case, the law is the AFCFTA and it does not permit us to move beyond um, uh, and introduce measures for the movement of uh, 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 free movement of persons. That is for the member states, not for the AFCFTA secretariat. Um, now on infrastructure, absolutely it is correct that we have to have uh, complementary policies and complementary measures because you do need infrastructure, whether it is ro roads, whether it is ports, um, you do need infrastructure to facilitate um, trade and to enhance uh, trade uh, on the African continent. Um, we, of course, will work together with uh, African multilateral development finance institution, uh, institutions to leverage on the policy complementarity between the work that we do, the mandate that we have, and also from a development finance uh, perspective, their mandates and the work that they do on infrastructure development. I think we have to be uh, conscious of the fact that we have, uh, um, we do not have an unlimited mandate to do everything. Um, the agreement is very clear about what it is that we as the Secretariat can do under the AFCFTA, and we have to stick within the mandate uh, that we have. But uh, it is obviously, um, it is trite that there are complementarities between trade and infrastructure development. And in order for us to double intra-Africa trade by uh, the year 2035 or sooner, if we can, infrastructure is a critical part of that. And that is why I say we will work together with um, the development finance institutions on the African continent. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. Our next question is coming from uh, Gamu Shirai Mutezo. He did not uh, identify his press organ, but he has two questions for us. And his first question is, how will we manage relations or extent to which we trade in import material with countries such as uh, China? I understand it will not be an overnight journey. Question two, he says, please share with us if available, the mechanics of starting to use the African passport visa requirements application processes. We'll go to our next question coming from Abdul Latif Balanta. He, his question is, can you envision a day as we can in the diaspora when import and uh, certified diaspora companies may be afforded the same concessions, levy and tariff waivers, although coming from the sixth, sixth region of Africa. If you may want to take a third question, Excellency, it's yes, coming yes. From, from Daniel uh, Vambunu. How can the United States of Africa and Global Pan-Africanism Network partner with the African Union in the realization of the expected benefits of the AFCFTA is, is intended to bring? Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for the questions. Um, on the first question from uh, uh, Gamu, there are rules of origin which are um, currently being negotiated and rules of origin serve a number of purposes. The first purpose uh, rules of origin serve is um, they assist in the prevention of um, infiltration, if I can use that word, 
of uh, uh, third country goods into the AFCFTA market. Um, they enable us uh, to uh, prevent transshipment of goods. We want this agreement to create jobs on the African continent. We do not want this agreement to create job losses. We want this agreement to create jobs. And we have negotiated and structured our rules of origin in such a way that there is a high threshold for value addition, and that there is a high standard for value addition. In other words, you will not be able to import a shirt from a third country, put a button on it, and say made in the AFCFTA. We want to foster industrial development on the African continent. This is the second uh, um, uh, purpose of rules of origin that uh, uh, have a high threshold for value addition. We want to make sure that whether we are talking about raw materials, whether we are talking about commodities, um, whether we are talking about uh, all products under a country's economy, we want to make sure that 20 to 30 years time, um, Africa has industrialized and that leveraging our, on our rules of origin regime that we actually create value addition on the African continent. I think if anything that we've learned from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, it is that we have an over-reliance on the import of all of these products that we require to fight the pandemic, germ-killing products, um, the personal protection equipment, the masks and so on. I am I'm very happy that in the last few months, um, we, we have heard um, uh, countries on the African continent redesigning uh, and repurposing their industrial development posture to make sure that we manufacture this uh, equipment that is required to fight the pandemic, that we manufacture it on the African continent. And so rules of origin are very, very important to ensure that we prevent what Gamu is saying, and that is uh, uh, goods that are coming in into the AFCFTA market that are not entitled to preferential treatment, uh, who would be getting that preferential treatment. We will have to be robust in implementing and applying our rules of origin re regime so that we don't create job losses. And we will have to make sure that we work very closely with customs authorities across the African continent uh, to make sure that we build the capacity of our customs authorities and that we build the enforcement capacity of our customs authorities to fight this uh, issue of transshipment of goods. We are not saying there should be no third country goods. We are simply saying that goods that should enjoy AFCFTA preferential treatment should be goods that are legitimately entitled to AFCFTA preferential treatment. We will still get goods coming in from other parts of the world, but they will not be enjoying the preferences that we have agreed to extend to one another in the AFCFTA. It all will depend on our robust application and implementation of our uh, rules of origin uh, regime. And for that, we will have to work with our customs authorities to ensure that we improve their capacity. We have already had two meetings with the customs authorities here in Accra, Ghana last year. All African customs authorities were here. So these are things that, um, that we are actively working on um, at the moment. Now, imports from, from the diaspora, um, it will depend on our rules of origin regime. Um, our rules of origin regime has a very, very stringent uh, standard for products that enjoy preferences, that these products have to be either wholly obtained on the African continent, or there has to be substantive, substantive value addition on the African continent of a product that comes in from a third country. And so depending on the product and depending on the, uh, the threshold for value addition, um, it, it, goods that are coming in from third countries may not enjoy 
the same preferences as goods that are manufactured on the African continent or where there's value addition on the African continent, because we want to foster industrial development here on the African continent. But I will say this, um, already we are seeing signals from global investors um, that they are looking at the African market positively because of our rules of origin regime um, that is going to be uh, that will place a high value addition requirement. For example, in the area of automobiles, um, the local content requirement in many African countries is relatively high. It is relatively high, and the reason is to foster industrial development in country, in region, in the con on the continent of Africa. But, but some automobile manufacturers look at that as a positive thing because they look at it as an opportunity to invest um, on the African continent. And so this question of rules of origin is very, very important and is directly linked uh, to Africa's sustained industrial development uh, over decades uh, to come. The last question about how to partner um, uh, uh, with us to, to fulfill the objectives of the AFCFTA, we are always willing to work with uh, similarly minded organizations or institutions or individuals, uh, because we recognize this is about advancing Africa's uh, uh, development, economic development objectives. And Africa's development, economic development objective is bigger than one individual, is bigger than uh, one institution. It will require that we work together collectively whether we are on the African continent or outside of the African continent, we will have to work together to make sure that uh, we partner uh, to build investment links, to build regional value chains for industrial development on the African continent, to do all of these things that will accelerate um, the, 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 the industrial development of the African continent. And so our door is open to work with you, to partner with you for Africa's industrial development and economic development in general. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary General uh, Wemkele Mene. Our next question is coming from uh, Ambassador Brieka Bennett. She is the head of mission for the Diaspora Africa Forum, DAF. And her question is, how will you be including the African diaspora in, the, in, in this important initiative? Mm. And uh, Oliver Shikoze, ah, okay, no, there is no question there. And then we go to our next person who is uh, from Cape Town. He just says he's happy to be here. And uh, our next person is uh, from Grace uh, Asari. Uh, no, she's what she wants to know if this, web, if this webinar will be recorded and uh, if they will, need, they will have a story after this for publication. And uh, Mr. Gam or Mrs. Gamu Chirai Mutrezo. We've already answered that question. Okay. Excellency, maybe you first answer that question from uh, Ambassador Bennett and we'll yes. find more questions here. And, and thank you again for the questions and thank you Ambassador Bennett for, for your question. Um, the, of course, the African Union, uh, and we all know this, recognizes the, um, the diaspora as a sixth region and so we have to uh, um, work together with the diaspora in uh, advancing uh, the African uh, uh, objectives of the African continent uh, for integration. Um, I, I must confess, I don't have the answers in that respect. Uh, all I can say is that um, we will work together with the diaspora 
uh, to ensure that um, uh, in our implementation of this uh, agreement, there is a role for them. Uh, the diaspora has access to global capital markets. The diaspora has access to, uh, to technology, uh, to, to skills. Um, that we know, for example, we know that there are um, uh, investment uh, uh, um, opportunities in Africa that the diaspora may want to consider. We know that there are private equity firms that are owned and run uh, by uh, people in the diaspora who have access, as I say, uh, to capital markets, uh, who can and have the, the capacity to invest on the African continent. So we would have to work together to identify these investment opportunities that are now enabled, uh, that are now enabled by uh, the AFCFTA. Um, but as I say, I don't have all the answers. Um, we working together will have to find all the answers uh, but certainly there is um, a, a role for the diaspora um, to, to contribute in the implementation of the AFCFTA. And I look forward to working with uh, Ambassador Bennett and, uh, and the diaspora um, in that regard. I think there was a question about recording. I, 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 I'm not sure uh, um, that that was directed at me, but I know that the colleagues in studio, um, they, they, uh, they will respond to that particular question. Yeah, I think we are, do, the, I can say uh, for sure that it is being recorded and that uh, maybe your office or the Department of Trade and Industry in the African Union might uh, come out with a, with a press release at the end of this to give outcomes of this press conference. Uh, Excellency, we have a question from David Mick Ja. He says, please, we want to know how far are we prepared to lower the cost of payment in items or in terms of dynamic currency convention, DCC, for all countries, real-time aggregate demand data for ATO, and the tagging, tracking, and monitoring of goods and services for rules of origin, also, what is the current plan for the Pan-African Payment Settlement System, PASS, to be integrated into all ratified countries' custom systems? Excellency, you can take that one first. Thank you very much. Um, so on, on the question of uh, currency, we, of course, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have a limited mandate. Um, our mandate is trade uh, um, implementation of the AFCFTA. Um, uh, however, uh, I will say that this, that in respect of uh, the challenges around uh, currency and currency convertibility as it relates to trade, um, as I mentioned earlier, we have already ta started taking steps to confront that challenge. We are introducing the payments and settlement platform um, which will be pan-African, all state parties will have the opportunity, if they so desire, uh, to switch on to the platform. And the way it will work is that um, African Bank will be the, uh, the settlement uh, or the, uh, what is technically referred to as the intermediary bank. They will do the payments and the settlement um, uh, uh, in order to cut, to reduce the cost of converting the currency uh, from your local currency to the uh, currency of the at the receiving end, this is very important for ensuring that we we have we reduce the cost of uh, trade on the continent. We make it more affordable and uh, more uh, efficient. I expect that in the next uh, six six to twelve months that. Um, the payments, uh, the, the Pan-African Payments and Settlement Platform will be fully effective across the African continent. There were some delays that, of course, were uh, uh, occasioned by COVID-19. Um, there is a pilot of six countries uh, that is being ra uh, rolled out at the moment, um, but we have to uh, continue working hard to make sure that as many countries as possible 
are part of um, the Pan-African Payments and Settlement Platform. And in this regard, we have already uh, started uh, consulting with Africsim Bank, uh, I'm sorry, with uh, uh, the African Association of Central Banks, uh, so that uh, we have a collective uh, collectivity in, um, in, in ensuring the rollout of the Pan-African uh, Payments and Settlement Platform. Um, regarding tracking rules of origin, the rules of origin um, implementation will happen at national level or regional level if you are a customs union. What we are in the process of designing are digital enabled tools um, that will make sure that from a customs uh, point of view, everything is accessible on a digital platform. So certificate of origin, uh, with the necessary security, blockchain features, and all, and all of those required elements of it. Um, or what we want to do is that ultimately, um, as we trade under the AFCFTA, all our trade under the AFCFTA, there is a digital platform um, from in term, from, on, on which you can, you can access a new market on the African continent, on, in terms of which you can verify a certificate of origin on this digitally enabled uh, platform. So that in general, trade on the African continent in 15 years time is uh, more accessible, um, much cheaper, affordable, and more, most importantly, more efficient. I think we have seen the advantages through this COVID-19 phase, we've seen the advantages of digitally enabled uh, uh, platforms and technology. And there are, par there are parts of the African continent that by the way are already, in some countries already, we have uh, evidence of farmers of flour who access um, uh, global flour markets using digitally enabled platforms um, in the Af from the African continent. Uh, so you can see already there's potential uh, for this to, uh, to have a massive impact on uh, boosting intra-Africa trade on the African continent. I think those, uh, uh, Madam Tanko, are all the questions that, um, that I took note of. Um, perhaps we can take one final round uh, if, um, if, uh, uh, if that's fine. Thank you, Excellency. Okay, our next uh, question is coming from Peter Fabricio. Um, he says, an article in the Daily Maverick by trade analyst Donald McKay says that South Africa is only trading so far with Egypt and Sao Tome and Principe. And uh, Egypt has since said that it is still negotiating terms with uh, SACU, therefore, also with South Africa, and Botswana has not ratified the AFCFTA. So this suggests SACU, and therefore, South Africa will not be able to trade with Egypt or anyone else. Please explain. Well. Customs unions and uh, uh, the, the question that Peter refers to, it, it talks about SACU, um, which is a customs union. Usually customs unions uh, have to trade under the same uh, terms at the same time, um, under a common external tariff. Um, and I don't know the details of what uh, SACU and South Africa have, have agreed to. What I do know is that um, from a customs readiness point of view, uh, Egypt, Saku, uh, Egypt, South Africa, and Ghana are ready. It may very well be that uh, within the customs union itself, the customs, uh, the members of the customs union will have to come to an arrangement about what do you do when one of the members of that customs union uh, is not ready. That is an, a matter that is entirely um, for internal arrangements of the African 
of the uh, 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 the Southern African Customs Union or any other customs union. And by the way, SACU is not the only one in this situation. There are um, uh, countries in the East African community who have not yet ratified. There are countries in uh, ECOWAS who have not yet ratified. And there are countries in uh, SACU who have not yet ratified. Um, what I, I must confront head on is the underlying suggestion um, from whoever wrote that article, and that is to say that we must not move forward as the African continent until everybody is at the same level of readiness. If we take that approach, we are not going to make any progress as the African continent. We've got to make progress. We've got to start moving forward with those countries that already have the infrastructure in place. And I will also emphasize that we've got 34 countries who have deposited the instruments of ratification. That means that these countries are legally committed uh, to the start of trading. And for those countries who may not have the customs infrastructure in place yet, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there are modalities for how uh, they will give credit uh, to traders. Um, so what I contest very vigorously from whoever wrote that article, I contest the idea that because there are challenges of readiness here and there, we must therefore take a step back as the African continent and not move forward. You must remember in um, I I about four or five decades ago, the European Union was not at this level of uh, uh, integration that we have today. When the European Union started as a, a, um, a small uh, group of countries, there were similar challenges. There were similar challenges of readiness. Some countries joined later, some countries joined, yet were not ready, but they understood the political importance um, of integration of the market in Europe. And so similarly on the African continent, we must not, ex we must not hold Africa to a much higher standard uh, uh, from a trade perspective that no, uh, nobody else has ever met before. There has never been a trade agreement where everybody trades on the same day at the same time. Why should it be different for the African continent? Why do you expect, why do you hold Africa to a different standard under international trade law? I think it's unfair. So the point I make is this, there are countries who are ready, who are moving forward with those countries who are trading under this regime. There are countries who have expressed commitment and they will introduce the customs procedures um, as time uh, moves forward. So I thank you very much, Madam Tanko, and I want to thank um, uh, all, all uh, the journalists and everybody who uh, has joined us uh, this afternoon. Um, thank you very much and God bless the African continent. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Excellency Secretary General of the African Continental Free Trade Area. Dear colleagues, with this, we have come to the end of our press uh, virtual conference and uh, we have Taking note of all the other questions that have been submitted, we will make sure we give answers to them and respond to you through your emails. And uh, we want to wish you a happy end of day. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you.